at Clackamas Fire, we believe and we are always here for you. We value our people and the people we serve. Our focus is establishing teams. Stands for trust, empowerment, accountability, mindset, and service. Today is Monday, of the January 24th. The board meeting of Clackamas Fire District 1 come to order. This meeting is called to order per ORS 192.610 to 690. And over us 192.650, the meeting is being recorded. The video call recording of this meeting will be placed on the Clackamas Fire and Sandy Fire website. Change. Chief, is there any changes to the agenda? Uh, thank you, Thomas, uh, Mr. President. Yes, we have one item that uh, we have changed, as you will notice on the updated uh, Agenda will be item B2, and that's request uh, for board approval for uh, Jasmine Schneider to the Board of Trustees for the Clackamas uh, Emergency Services Foundation. Thank you. Approval of the regular board meeting minutes from December 20th, 2021. Does any board member have any comments or changes to share? Thomas, I'll need to abstain because I wasn't at the meeting. Okay, thank you. Since there are no other changes to the meeting minutes, the minutes from the regular board meeting on December 20th, 2021 stand approved as written. Tracy, do we have any public comments signed up? Ms. Tracy. Thank you. Um, I did not receive any signups via email or phone call. So am I still asking questions and working with you rather than Ariel? Is she in training or is she taking oh, over? She is she is in training and so okay. you can yeah ask okay. go so, through me. <laughs> so you so you are my person today. Yes, correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um since we don't have any, we will move to the next item. Presentation by Chief Doug Whiteley, Operation Santa Update. All right, thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you this evening about this past, which would have been 2021. Operation Santa to give uh, what we've historically done is kind of a looking back review of the success of it and uh, some of the some of the things that came about from it. Let's see here, Tracy, if you could bring up that PowerPoint, please. Sure, hang on just a second. Yep, no problem. Perfect. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I mean, let's see. I'm going to take my glasses off because the reflection of the screen on my lenses is probably more annoying to me than anybody else, but it was bugging me. So, all right, here we go. So uh, 2021 Operation Santa, uh, I, I would say this year was a success. We had a lot of fun with it. Uh, it did look a little bit different from past years, though in some ways similar to last year. If we go to the next slide, Tracy. So if you recall, uh, a couple months ago, we uh, kind of ran through the plan for this year with you all, uh, just to make sure everybody understood what was going on and, and we were on the same page. Uh, this year, we did five drive-through donation drop-off events, and those are spread throughout the fire district at, at five different locations, one in Oregon City, one in Happy Valley, one in Clackamas at our training center, one in Boring, and then the last one was uh, kind of in the downtown uh, Milwaukee area right by City Hall. Uh, each of those uh, had a, a chunk of time with them. It varied uh, depending upon the day of it, but uh, anywhere from you know six to eight hours total on those. 
so also as part of that, uh, for the food and toy distribution, this was the big piece that we shared with you guys before was uh, the fire district was not going to be doing the warehouse this year, which we have done historically. Uh, but as an alternate, we partnered with some different community partners to try to bolster uh, how this stuff got out through the community and, and to kind of, I guess, support them in their endeavors on that. And, and, I, and the next slide will show that, but that really was a success. Uh, aside from the numbers, uh, we really built some strong relationships with this uh, for this year. Uh, the main people we partnered with was the Clackamas Service Center, which has a big uh, distribution building in Clackamas. And then also a different part of Clackamas is the Amen group that we partnered with as well. Uh, both of them uh, were able to take everything that we offered for donations and redistribute those throughout the community. Uh, the really neat thing about the partnership with the Clackamas Service Center, not only did they have all their families that they served because of us, but they had about uh, 15 different subgroups that they worked with to share with those, uh, those groups to share amongst their constituents. Uh, this was really successful uh, from the fire district perspective uh, because it allowed the fire district to redistribute all those donated items throughout the entire fire district. Uh, I know I referenced both of those groups are in the Clackamas area, but they partnered with groups throughout the entire fire district, several Lions Clubs, DHS, different groups like that, uh, to really kind of maximize how broad this was spread out. Uh, the next piece, the organizational participation. Um, I, I believe uh, Chief Dieters could attest to this, uh, the involvement from paid staff this year uh, was higher than it has been in the past. It's always been involved with some, uh, but the district uh, leadership team really made a conceited effort to participate at each one of these events, uh, even if it was showing up, um, you know, supporting them, bringing coffee, bringing food, helping gather toys, sitting on Santa's lap, any one of those things like that. Chief Brown, that was for you, just so you know. Um, and uh, it, it really, it made it a lot of fun. It made it successful. I, I can't speak for the volunteer group. Uh, maybe uh, Vice President Kearney could speak to that later. But I think it did mean a lot to kind of have that deeper partnership with our volunteers. Because uh, frankly, the success of Operation Santa really lies with our volunteer group. They do a lion's share of the work. Uh, the district does some of the organization. And then they jump up and take so much of that work on it. They're what make it truly successful. So any way we can support them uh, throughout that, I think is so valuable. Uh, though we just ended the season, uh, 2022 planning will begin soon. Um, uh, we hope to uh, continue with some of the success you see on this year and some of the changes, but also try to bring back some of the traditions we've seen in the past. Uh, we're working through the consideration of how to successfully reintroduce some parades in the future, uh, but maybe revisit uh, how the donations are collected and maybe continue those with drop-off sites uh, with more of the uh, parades being a show and tell, uh, reminding people of the drop off events, connecting those in some way or somehow. Uh, a good example of it this year, this is year two of that, is we coordinated our drop off event with uh, Happy Valley's tree lighting, which really made that a, a lot of fun. There's a lot of people around and really a great success moving forward. Uh, next slide, please, Tracy. So for 2021, the collection totals were about 8,400 pounds of collected food, uh, just under 3,500 toys total, which is a really high number. And, and I apologize, um, I had some updated numbers. Those estimated families served are actually a lot greater than that 300. Uh, right now, we're looking at over 700 families served because of the fire district's partnership, which uh, if you've seen these presentations in the past, that does exceed what we feel like we've uh, been able to partner with and share in the past. I think what recognizing the difference historically has been that we had the one-on-one -on -one connection with families versus in this case, uh, we're providing to another party to distribute to those families. But kind of last where I left off was over 700 families we connected with uh, and, and obviously potentially more in growing from there. Um, the, uh, I think the big piece with that too is recognizing if you look back, I didn't include it on the slide, but when you compare to last year, which was a similar fashion, just more drop-off events, uh, there was uh, a few thousand pounds more food collected. Um, but in this case, we collected about 1,300 more toys than we did in the past, than last year. So a little lower on the food, but higher on the toys when you make a year-by-year -year comparison. Again, we're looking forward to planning this for next year and uh, trying to bolster it a little bit and trying to re reintroduce a few parades to, because uh, uh, I know the community really values those and enjoys those. I'd happy to answer any questions anybody has of me.
directors, anybody have any questions? No, thanks, Doug. That was great. Perfect. Sounds like some strong work again. Well, thank you. And I, I do really mean that this, it goes to the volunteers. They, they did so much of the lion's share of the work. It's, it, it's, they are the true success of this. Chris, do you have any comments? Uh, just thanks to everybody. It sounds like they did some great stuff and uh, I'm sure the community appreciates it. So thanks to everybody for their work. Uh, I, you know, Jim, do you have anything to say? Oh, no, I concur. The volunteers do an, an outstanding job. We wouldn't be able to have that entire program without them. So their uh, services are very valuable. And thank you, Doug, for uh, taking over and taking the lead this year. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. Doug, I have a couple of questions and comments. First yes, of sir. all, this report, I'd like to take consider this as an assessment of our changes from 20. 20 to uh, 2019 to 2021. What uh, was it more food collected? I know toys, more toys collected, but what about the more to food? Was it? Yeah, yeah, I don't have those numbers in front of me. Uh, maybe Chief Dieters does. I would guarantee you in 2019, both the food and the toys were at a higher number because that was the most recent year that we did every one of the parades and collected during the parades. Did you hear any kind of negative comments about our new program or drop-off sites and uh, uh, collection process we did? I did not. I, I think a lot of people enjoyed the drop-off events. Um, the, there's just a different way to donate and maybe if they didn't have a, uh, a parade that went directly by their house or something like that. Uh, we did hear a few questions and uh, uh, hearkening back to parade days, we did, we did hear from some of the community interest in the parades, though, to be fair, um, other than maybe one individual, everyone was very understanding of uh, due to COVID, but also recognizing the difficulty of potentially transitioning from parades uh, that used to do collection versus parades that don't do collection. So uh, I overwhelmingly a big support from the community on the changes, though, from the sense I got. The communication that I have with you and Nick and Steve is that this is a change. And of course, anytime when we make changes, community gets in the shock and may not be quite uh, understanding. But once we are able to explain and work the system on why we are doing that, they will be more compassionate and be supportive. Uh, I know you are already planning and you're going to have some parade, but not collecting food. There, there's some uh, re-engineering going on with the Operation Santa? Yeah, and I would say to, uh, we'll throw that asterisk in there. It's all speculation at this point. Um, I know, uh, it, though it is a year off, we, we kind of want to walk through different scenarios before we uh, dive into really the what the actual changes will be. That is one of the considerations, though, for sure. If you do look in your chats, thank you, Tracy, for the quick work. Uh, she was able to bring up the numbers from 2019, and you'll see the the, the numbers are very vast uh, given the last year of those parades, uh, just about 54,000 pounds of food and about 9,000 toys from 2019. Wow, oh, that's good. Yeah, that's- Doug, good. do any of the scenarios involve me getting to ride in a fire engine? I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. You can make me get older. I don't have to grow up. I checked the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Director Haas, I even considered some version of a, a maybe superimposing you on a fire engine to see if that'd hold you over for a year, maybe. But um, uh, I would scare the that. kids in the neighborhood. <laughs> uh, I will defer that question to probably Chief Brown. I think he could. Yeah, I know. That best. Okay. I thought that you were the Santa that I was sitting on the lap, Chris, but it wasn't you. So sorry. But, but defer to Chief Brown means no. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, this is a signature event for our district, and it is kind of a a major event and uh, I'm sure between all of you responsible for this will put bring it and the only thing that I want to suggest is sometime in the fall we need to publicize uh, with the help of Chief Brandon to make sure the community know what they are, what we are changing and why we are changing or what difference it is making so uh, I like to have that community kept abreast of the changes we are making. Is there any Absolutely. other questions or anybody has? Perfect. 
Thank you all for the support. And uh, again, thank you, Trace, for the quick work on those numbers. Okay, thank you, Chief Doug. Our uh, request board approval of resolution 22-01, adopting and appropriating supplemental budget for the fiscal year 2021-2022. CFO, Chief Whitaker. Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this item is to request approval of a, a supplemental budget. Um, and I know we went over some of this at the work session last week, so I'll try not to repeat myself uh, too much. Um, but at the work session, we discussed how our current year shortfalls related to uh, property tax receipts expected to come in lower, as well as increased operational replacement costs. Um, so this supplemental budget starts to address part of that problem uh, with some immediate reductions that have been identified uh, by the leadership team, division chiefs, and department heads uh, to reduce um, some positions, some overtime, as well as some materials and services. Um, in total, identifies media reductions of about 560,000. Um, it also recognizes some additional revenue that we're receiving this year, particularly from the um, wildland reimbursements, as well as ambulance revenue and um, some other things and other reimbursements. Um, and then some just corrects, make some technical changes to the budget, really kind of realigning expenses among the various org units um, to reflect the movement of positions with, with some of the reorganization that we've done and, and correct some, some things that were initially done in the budget. Um, to be clear, this, this supplemental budget, this round of it does not fully address the, the current year short, shortfall that we identified. Um, for example, it does not yet make the reduction that we talked about in, in the property tax receipts. Um, I left that as it is for now so that um, until later in the year, we have a better estimate of what uh, the final property tax receipts are gonna look like. And it also gives us some time to continue to um, identify and, and implement some, some solutions to reduce costs in the current year as well as ongoing. Um, so I do expect that in, in May or June, um, if not earlier, We'll come back with a with another supplemental budget to to make everything um, tie together and move any contingency over that we might need to 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 make it work. Um, but at this time, you know these these are the expenses that we've already identified that we're ready to implement. So um, I think I'll I'll leave it at that. Um, but if there are if there are questions, um, please let me know. Um, Marilyn, you were not at the work session, right? Yes, I was there, Thomas. Okay. Do you have any particular questions or did you have you clarified with Chief Whitaker before or? I Maybe. already talked to Mark. Or, um, that's what I thought. My questions and that's to... what, yeah, that's what you normally do, clarify anything beforehand. So thank you for doing that. Any board members have any questions or comments to share? No, none? Okay. Do I hear a motion for the board to approve resolution 22-01, adopting and appropriating a supplemental budget for the fiscal year 21-22? So moved, Jay. Jay moved. I'll second. Chris seconded. Tracy, please call the roll. Marilyn? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Chris? Yes. Jim? Yes. And Jay? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, fellow board members, and the motion stand approved. Uh, the next item is request board approval for Jasmine Schneider of Colton Fire as a trustee for the Clackamas Emergency Services Foundation. Chief Brown. Thank you, uh, Thomas and Direct, uh, President Joseph and members of the board. Uh, the recommendation has brought, been brought forward from the executive committee of, of the Clackamas uh, Emergency Services Foundation uh, to approve of the board of trustees um, for Jasmine Schneider of Colton Fire. Um, Jasmine has been, the, has been acting in this capacity as a liaison uh, for Colton Fire for some time now. She has been uh, engaged and has a lot of energy uh, towards this position. 
And it is a recommendation not only from the board of trustees, but as well as the executive committee to approve her as being a, a new board of trustee. Just to make it clear, if it will make it easy, please address me as Thomas. You don't have to go president and Joseph and then all that stuff, just simple, plain Thomas. Copy that, Thomas. Thank you. Love it. Um, now, <laughs> do I hear a motion for the board to approve Jasmine Schneider as a trustee for the Clackamas Emergency Services Foundation? So moved, Thomas. Chris moved. Jay second. Jay seconded. Tracy, please call the roll. Thomas? Yes. Jim? Yes. Jay? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. And Chris? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for our fellow board members. And the other business items are no action required is legislative update from lobbyist Genoa. Lo Happy New Year, Genoa. We haven't have talked to you. Happy New uh, Year. I know. Thank you. Hey. So just a couple of things. As you know, the legislative session will begin uh, February 1st. Um, receive notice that it will once again be a virtual session. That is all of the committees will meet virtually. We will not be able to meet with legislators in person. Um, it is not known yet if the House and Senate galleries will be open so that we can watch the floor proceedings, but that's the way it stands right now. Um, there are a couple of items that came up that I forwarded to Chief Brown and Chief Paxton. One of them is a reincarnation of a media access bill that we were able to successfully kill last legislative session. And with the help of Brandon, we were able to craft some language that um, was adopted. Essentially, there are uh, very strict provisions before the media is allowed access to the scene of an event. And um, the most important thing is, uh, bottom line, is if the incident commander says no, then um, the, the media is denied access. So we are pretty comfortable with that. I don't anticipate um, testifying against the bill this time. They, were, they acquiesced to everything that we requested. The second thing that I received was a draft that had to do with sprinklers. And of course that had my full attention until I read the bill and realized they were talking about uh, landscape sprinklers. And I called the proponents and I said, why am I getting this? Am I missing something? And they said, no, we just thought because you're the fire service, you care about sprinklers. <laughs> so I told them, no, we don't care about landscape sprinklers. And then the last thing, um, probably the most controversial um, is a legislative concept. There's not a bill number yet, LC 96. Um, that's being brought forward by Representative Graver, um, House District uh, 25, so over in Tigard. She is a firefighter, has been a firefighter with Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue. And she had a bill um, that expanded the cancer presumption. And um, there was a lot of negotiation going on between primarily special districts association and um, the firefighters association. And um, it started to become very, very broad where they were including um, bladder cancer, et cetera. And whereas um, special districts at one point had hoped to become neutral, um, decided to oppose the bill because there was concern that it would bankrupt small districts if they were pay paying workers comp for you know all such an expanded list of cancers. So the Oregon Fire Chiefs Association remained neutral. The fire district directors took an opposing position. The special districts took an opposing position. And I believe the volunteers remained neutral as well. But just know that that's out there. It was heard before um, MLAC. Uh, on Friday, Management and Labor Advisory Committee, and they took no action on Friday, but I do anticipate that the bill will be up before the session and there will be lots more discussion. So I wanted to make you aware of it. And that was all I had at this point. Does any board members have questions or comments to share? Good. Thank you. Genoa, thank you so much. So nice to see you. It's so good to see you. I can't wait to see you in person. I know. It's going to be a while. Yeah, I don't anticipate it happening in the near future. Chief Brown, 
now give an update from the office of the fire chief. I need to unmute myself. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you, Thomas. So um, as far as uh, updates uh, from the fire chief's office, um, there's just a couple things I want to highlight. <clears throat> um, the, the district assisted in preparations across the county for uh, analog to digital radio cutover. The uh, cutover went smoothly, um, and that was on January 11th. Uh, that was uh, Chief Carlson led that uh, countywide effort. Uh, super impressed with, with uh, the seamless transition in a very complex situation. Um, a couple other things at the request of the National Fire of the National Fire Academy, um, Chief Health, Health and Safety Officer uh, Health, Heather Goodrich attended and provided input uh, on the pilot of the National Fire Academy's Fire Service Safety Essentials. Um, the fire district submitted for an AFG grant at the re uh, request for, I believe is $1.7 million for cardiac monitors. Um, just a brief update, I might be stealing some of Dan's thunder here. If I do, Dano, I apologize. Uh, but just a, a quick thing with the crews, they ran uh, almost 27,000 calls last year, 26,968 calls for service. Um, a couple other highlights, uh, added CAD capabilities to the water tenders and brush rigs. That was huge. And that was one of the recommendations that came from the after action review. Um, what the old system was, is it was radio based uh, and the, the water tender would try to keep up with the fire engine to get where they were, where, where they were trying to get to for fires or they'd use their iPhones. Now we have them as being in, in the CAD and you can track where they are with a vehicle locator, which is super, super good for, um, for span of control and, and accountability reasons. Um, implemented squad 13, 319, which Dan can speak to, and uh, obviously made a lot of changes based on the 2020 after action review. A um, lot, of, lot of hard work by the staff um, and, and our people uh, across the fire district, just uh, super impressed with a busy year again, just all the efforts by everybody. Um, that is all that I have. I'd love to turn some time over to Heather for uh, an update. Before I bring on Heather, Director Chris, I, I'm i sorry I overlooked your portion of the civil service update. Do you have anything to report? I was just sending you a message because I wasn't sure if I was supposed to submit a written report and I was behind on my homework. <laughs> um, because I didn't do that. It's my overlook, Chris. It's my, my, my fault. Oh, that's fine. Uh, they... Uh, the last meeting of the Civil Service Commission, their first item was to appoint a, uh, a new chair. Uh, it's done at the first meeting of the year every year, so obviously it was time to do that, and Jim Dilley was elected uh, the new president. Um, they also had some civil service rule changes related to residency requirements for um, the chief examiner that they kind of cleaned up what was in there. Um, they, uh, all, they approved lateral entry fire testing uh, results, entry level, there was one other, I think, uh, but maybe not. I'm uh, kind of having to check my notes. I don't have my regular notes. You guys might have noticed my scenery different. I'm actually at my office out in Estacada because I was welding a bunch of new stuff together on the machine up until about 10 minutes before the meeting started. Um, they also looked at a chief examiner, an interim chief examiner. And this one, I am gonna to defer to Chief Stewart because they were going back and forth between whether they were gonna appoint Chief Dieters as the interim or Chief Stewart as the interim. And to be honest with you, it went back and forth long enough and it was long enough ago. I don't remember where it ended up. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Director Haas. Uh, it ended up they appointed uh, Chief Dieters um, the, the primary piece was he was unable to attend that meeting uh, that evening, um, and so they just wanted a little bit more discussion about his background and experience and what our intent was moving forward. So, And if you miss a meeting, you know what happens. You're going to get appointed <laughs> to something. I thought you were smarter than that, Steve, but you know. Uh, so I think that was all I had. It was a you know productive meeting. They kind of got worked through everything they needed to, and um that was kind of my first time as a liaison. So I kind of got to meet everybody in a different capacity, I guess. 
Thank you for a very good report. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Chief, Chief of Health and Safety, Heather Goodrich, will give us a safety update. Good evening, everyone. Um, so my brief update tonight is unfortunately about COVID, and I so look forward to a time when I can update you on something other than COVID. Um, but we've been talking about budget. Um, it's all over the news with the Omicron variant. So just wanted to tell you a little bit of where we've been in the last um, seven months. So uh, from July 1st to December 31st, uh, we had 26 COVID positive cases in our sworn career ranks, which is about 11% of that group. Um, and between January 1st of this year and today, we've had 11 sworn members of our group, which is about 5%. So that's why I broke it out because we're definitely seeing an uptick, just like what you've seen on the news um, of that variant spreading pretty rapidly. Um, it hasn't impacted our ability to serve our citizens, but it has definitely impacted our budget. Um, every time we have a COVID positive case, uh, we have to go through a notification process. So we have to talk to the COVID positive person and then notify any close contacts they may have had. And then if we have any high risk exposures and they meet certain criteria, then they have to be off work for a little while. So looking back um, since July, about two thirds of our COVID cases did not have any high risk exposures. We didn't send anybody home, but a third of those cases we did send people home. So um, we've put 27 people off since July. And I keep going back to July just because we're talking about this fiscal year's budget. Um, so anyway, just wanted to give you a little update on that. Um, we're also seeing the impact of COVID with our annual physicals. So we've been sending our career firefighters out to Adventist and it's been a slow process because due to COVID they had to lay off staffing and lay off one of their physicians. And so we don't wanna overwhelm them. Um, so we've just been sending out groups at a time. Um, and then we're getting ready for our lateral entry process, which we were able to block out times with Adventist. So we know that we've got um, them taken care of and then we're getting ready for our volunteers. So that's my update for this month. And I'm always happy to answer any questions. Heather. Uh, any directors have any questions? Okay. Now, um, correct me. Do we have some kind of a contract tracing or any of those kind of thing? Do we do that? We absolutely do. Um, I've created job forms for both the staff side and the sworn side. And uh -huh. our BCs have been amazing so that I don't have to be available 24 seven. Cause I will tell you, it seems like 90% of the COVID calls come in on nights and weekends. Um, and our BCs have been wonderful. So we make sure we let everybody know. Um, we go back 48 hours from when either the symptoms started or if the person was asymptomatic and maybe they tested because of a family member or something else um, from the COVID positive case. And so we make sure we notify everybody and we ask about their risk based off of how close they were, they were to the person, um, for how long they were there, if they were masked, not masked. And so we, we collect all of that data because I will tell you, uh, Clackamas County Public Health does reach out um, and follows up with uh, the COVID positives that they get notified about. And so they ask a lot of questions. They call it an investigation. And so it's so nice having all that information at my fingertips. So we have zero hospitalization, right? Um, that I, we had one person that I was aware of, um, but I wasn't notified about it, but I heard about a person, but that, that's all I know of right now. And they are back at work and they are fine. So yes, so, good. it's been pretty minimal. Um, yeah. I mean, people have not been feeling well, but um, it's impacted us pretty minimally on that front. Yeah, nevertheless, it makes an impact to our budget, it doesn't matter what else happens, but and that's what it is, what we have to deal with it. So, but thank you, Heather, appreciate it. Assistant Chief Stewart will now give a Office of Strategic Service update. Uh, good evening, thank you everyone. Uh, just a few things to touch on this evening before I uh, uh, concede some time to uh, Mike Carlson. Uh, first, uh, we're still in negotiations with the BC group or the battalion chief unit. Uh, those are ongoing and we, we hope to have those completed here shortly. Um, last month also saw a couple of uh, bigger pieces in terms of uh, response uh, outside the organization and response inside. The first being outside is winter storm. 
Um, and just from the support services side and the, the IT side and comm side, uh, our folks just did a fantastic job of making sure that our, our rigs were set and, and we had chains everywhere, uh, that the comms plan was, was there and that uh, really our, our support services uh, did what they were supposed to do and, and supported the operations of, of the district uh, and I think tied in with them uh, really well in, in the front end and were prepared to, to help as things progressed. Uh, and then secondly, uh, internally, uh, and I guess really across the world, Corona suffered a major uh, outage in terms of telestaff and, and really a, an online or, or uh, record timekeeping system. Um, they were attacked by ransomware back in early December, uh, which uh, I would just want to commend uh, our data services personnel, uh, Shelby and Troy Lynn, uh, primarily, and then also certainly uh, our coal board and everybody that touched it, including Shanti uh, and, and payroll, just to develop a backup system, uh, which they transitioned to everything to Excel. Um, and while we just got back up online with Telestaff with all their attention um, over the last week or so, the backup systems that they developed uh, when this went down are going to help secure us as we move forward. Um, so it was really a, a, a progression for us, and I appreciate that. Uh, and then the last piece, uh, just uh, to touch on, uh, after his term ended, uh, Josh Yerke uh, wrapped up his uh, term with the executive committee for CECOM, uh, and then I was appointed to replace him for the uh, next coming term. And that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any directors have any questions, comments? Okay, thank you. Chief Carlson. Thanks, Chief Thomas. That sounds odd to call you by your first name, but we'll do that. Uh, as Chief Brown indicated, we had cutover this year, and I'd say that touched about 12,000 radios system-wide. We did that successfully. Glad it's over. A little bit more work to do. But that's about all we've got for support services. Thanks for your time. Chief Carson, I'm a very simple, plain person. I'm not a formal guy. That's why I prefer. I have always used to be known as Thomas. Okay. Yes, Assistant Chief Dieters. Thank you, Thomas and uh, members of the board. I won't go through all the names, but uh, for community services, um, I'll highlight uh, um, community services this month. And uh, Chief Whiteley, uh, unfortunately, after the presentation has another meeting that he had to be on. So I'll, I'll be doing it and I'll probably butcher it a little bit, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so during December, obviously, Operation Santa, as you heard, took up a big chunk of time for those folks. And then uh, they participated in several public education events, uh, doing hands-only CPR at Gardner Middle School. And then they also attended an event at uh, Camp Withycombe. So events are still kind of peppered in and out throughout the month, and they're still attending as much as they can. Uh, and uh, Chief uh, Brown touched on the grant for the cardiac monitors. So they worked on that collaboratively, collaboratively with uh, other departments. And then um, also working, they're working right now on the annual uh, calendar for public events and things like that, and really focusing on some of the reoccurring or annual events that we do and trying to get those all in one spot so we can all kind of see what's going on throughout the year. And then even with all of the challenges with COVID and everything that's going on, schools are still reaching out and we're still back in schools working on uh, all hazard education with them. So happy to answer any questions, but that kind of sums it up for them this month, uh, past month. Anyone has any questions or comments? Okay, CFO Whitaker. Please give us the financial services update. Sure. Hello again. Uh, just a, a quick update. Uh, the, the financial report for uh, through December is, is included on page 20 of your packet. Um, I think we've probably talked enough budget, so I won't I won't go into that, but I'm happy to, to answer questions if there are any um, on that financial report or anything else. Um, my other update is on the audit. Um, as I think I reported at the last uh, board meeting, uh, we requested an extension um, to submit the audit to the state to January 31st. Um, so giving us an, an extra month beyond, beyond the typical deadline. Um, I'm meeting with the auditor uh, a few times this week to hopefully finalize that and, and meet that, that deadline, meaning we'll be able to bring it before the board um, in February. Um, and so I, I definitely understand the, the role the board plays in, in reviewing the audit and our financials in general. I wanna make sure we get that to you. Um, and you know, obviously the, the delay is not ideal, but with, with some staff turnover and, and things, we, we just weren't able to, to get it done. 
And as I think I mentioned last time, I, I do foresee some some pretty substantial changes to how we how we process year end and, and get the audit done next year. So my, myself and, and Michael Wong, our new finance manager, will do the the fund statements and financial report going forward next summer. And, and my commitment to everyone here is that you know you you hope you won't get it in January next year. Hopefully, you'll get it in in October at the latest November. So that's what we're shooting for going forward. Um, I think that's that's pretty much it for finance. We do hope to have the budget calendar out in the next week or two, just trying to finalize some of the the steps. It will be a little a little different as we look to to tackle the the deficit and and streamline things a bit. But we'll we'll get that out to to you and the budget committee as soon as possible. That's all I got. Any questions? Okay, well, this is moving good. Uh, emergency services. Division Chief George Santos. Good evening, all. Um, I have two bullet points to share with you. First is our EMS plan consultant work that's taking place. Um, the bulk of the work began last Tuesday and Wednesday, the 18th and 19th, where they, uh, the Cambridge Consulting Group did site visits for all the stakeholders in the county. Originally, we're supposed to be in person, but we're virtual due to Omicron. Uh, but ultimately were wildly successful um, and maybe even in some regards more successful than they would have been in person because they didn't have to divide and conquer they were all on one zoom platform and saw each every each and every stakeholders facilities and had conversations with them collectively instead of individually so that's that's the the positive spin we're putting on this today um, they are now going to dive into some more um, intimate individual uh, conversations with each of the stakeholders and have some some more large group discussions. And our focus now is the ambulance service plan. We have to develop an ambulance service plan so that we can put together an ambulance service contract that supports that um, by the end of the year. Um, the executive team, if you will, is what they're calling it of, of the of our county, which consists of Bill Conway, the EMS coordinator, um, Matt Dale, the EMS council chairperson, and the division chief of EMS at Canby Fire, Steve Bowie, the division chief of EMS at Tuolumne Valley, and I will help um, in the ambulance service plan review and modification. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and we'll keep you apprised on the next steps, but there's gonna be a lot of work going forward and it's gonna take a lot of staff hours in terms of, of our team. Mike Verkest, I just have to say in closing with that, he was in this virtual site visit, we did like an, a news reporter type of, of, of setup where he was the host if he was, he was Jeff Gianola of Channel 6, for lack of a better, and we had a series of field reporters that took it to the people out at the different sites, and he was amazing. He put together this whole presentation with, like, aerial footage, and it was commentating. It was and it was really entertaining, kept them engaged, and uh, we got lots of good feedback on that, um, so that was good. And then the other thing I have isn't quite as entertaining or as is um, positive. COVID has caused hospital wall times to increase significantly. So um, staffing shortages at hospitals and other areas are causing um, huge demands in the emergency rooms. Long-term care facilities are, are having to ship people out at higher frequencies. Um, and subsequently our first responders are on scene longer and our ambulances are at the hospital longer. And the short example I'll give you is medic three, uh, our, our, both of our medics uh, will we'll respond to a specific hospital in our county and they will be asked to, to stage in the parking lot. And they were there for like an hour and a half before they got brought into the emergency room to release their patient. I've never heard of that before ever. Um, what I can say is medical directors and, um, and high level individuals around the county are working on alternate destination protocols and plans, but um, those are really long in the works and I'm not sure that we'll see them in this, at least this current variant, just because of so many logistical and financial details and just the trickle down effect. But I'll continue to keep everybody apprised and keep working with Chief Mulek on that because it affects our operations uh, now and long in the future. That's all for today. My, my kudos to you for getting involved with the county and make them have a, a group from all of you participating and giving your input for the next contract. So it's it's a major change that is that is happening. So any other board members have any questions? Any comments? Okay. If hearing none, division chief Dan Mulek. Hey good evening Thomas. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I will uh, highlight uh, the training division. Uh, since Chief Brown took some of my operational highlights from me, um, 
I want to just throw out the hard work that uh, and acknowledge the hard work that the training division has, has put out lately. Uh, we have a volunteer academy that's going to graduate on February 17th. Uh, remaining in there, we have 10 Clackamas volunteers, six from Sandy and one from Gladstone. Uh, with that workload, we are doing skills drills with firefighter safety and survival, uh, hands-on drill that is uh, the crews have been rotating in uh, going on their third week. Uh, super impressive, the, uh, the caliber of trainers that we have within our organization. Um, Chief Olson is uh, a couple months into his position. Um, and he has his workload is tremendous. And, uh, and with that and all the organization takes in training, he's still, uh, he's focused on cleaning up the grounds and prepping for the academies, uh, setting up for an indoor classroom, a dirty classroom in the warehouse, um, getting rid of a lot of, uh, of, of old stock that just needs to be uh, removed to open up um, training uh, availability and, and just uh, square feet at the, at the warehouse and the training grounds. Um, we're prepped for ICS training starting next week, and uh, then the uh, the lateral academy that we have planned that uh, we're looking to kick off in March. Uh, I just want to highlight um, what operations has done in their relationships with our, our mutual aid partners, uh, highlighted by what Chief Santos is doing, and everybody kind of speaks to it. But uh, the, the Portland Fire Bureau had a line of duty death. Um, just recently where the fire district uh, covered part of their city uh, with engine and truck and BC coverage for uh, for their service. And the we the same thing with uh, Tualatin Valley, we provided uh, about half a day's worth of coverage in their area for a memorial service that was postponed almost two years due to uh, due to COVID. So they were finally able to get that done. And, uh, and it just it shows just great partnership and super proud of that. And as are the other organizations as well. Um, I'll just end on uh, just a couple, couple uh, highlights from December. Uh, Christmas Day, uh, we had one commercial fire. Uh, busy, the crews were busy and we had a car through a retirement home off of Webster Road, which on any other given day would have been a tremendous huge incident, newsworthy incident that we completely dodged the bullet on. Um, it, was, it was pretty impressive, but a very busy, busy Christmas day. And in the month of December, we had three technical rescue calls, uh, two of which patients were pinned underneath construction equipment. And, uh, and our rope rescue crews assisted Malala Fire with uh, the uh, evacuation with the rope system uh, for an injured logger. So um, operations is just moving along. That's really my report for you. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Any questions or comments? Okay, getting on. Assistant Shop Steward Patrick Dunn. Report about 1159. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, board members, for the opportunity to uh, come and speak on behalf of uh, 1159. Uh, my report for you this month is going to be very brief. Uh, everybody was pretty busy with the holidays uh in uh in december so i just have a couple things really to touch on uh first one is the Lavero family uh welcome to baby uh recently um the uh, uh d shift as far as issues going on in the uh with the union and the fire district the probably the two biggest things areas of focus uh number one would be uh the d shift committee working um, there's definitely a lot of interest uh, on the union side in how that shakes out. Um, it, uh, I know they're in the process of sorting through a number of different schedule options uh, and have been working with admin on uh, the admin side of the committee to, to figure out how those uh, work in terms of training admin, accomplishing the business functions of the district. Uh, so my understanding is they're starting to kind of narrow down the, the opportunities or, or sorry, the options. Uh, for different schedules, but um, I, us on the line will definitely, I'm not a part of that committee, so I know uh, us on the line are, are very eager to hear uh, how that all ends up sorting out, but they're starting to work through narrowing down the options and then also figuring out um, how, to, how they work with, with getting the district business done. Sorry about that, am I still on here? I had a call coming. Yeah, you're still on. I, I lost you guys on my screen as somebody tried to call me there. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on uh, is something Chief Stewart already touched on, which was the uh, telestaff uh, Kronos issue. Uh, there's been a lot of hard work that's gone in on the admin side to get that straightened out. Um, and uh, Station 7, uh, Captain Buford and the crew at Station 7 put in a ton of work um, managing that, helping to come up with that system. Um, 
and that's uh, that that's definitely been a big um, th those two things D shift and and then especially telestaff uh, have have been a big area of focus over the last uh, month. So uh, and that's really all I have. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? Thank you, Patrick. Directors, anyone has any questions? Okay. Volunteer Association Interim President, Jerry Corey. Jerry, can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Uh, is that better? Yes. Thank you. I'll repeat that. Thank you, Thomas, members of the board, chief officers, and others present. Uh, <clears throat> During the month of December, there were no drills. Uh, that is primarily because of the, the uh, efforts that went into Operation Santa. Um, Operation Santa absorbs a lot of energy. Um, in addition to uh, Operation Santa, there were five community events in which the association participated. Uh, I'd like to, before I go into the station coverage, <clears throat> go back and answer a question uh, that Thomas asked uh, earlier, uh, have I heard any negative comments uh, regarding Operation Santa? Uh, I have not heard negative comments. I've heard comments of disappointment. People want the parades. It's, I don't know another way to say that. I'm not trying to sell, sell parades or anything like that, but the reality is people appreciate it and want to see it. Uh, the coverage for the month, Station 12 had 24 out of 31 nights. Station 13 had 13 out of 31. Station 21, 21 had 24 out of 31. Uh, support had, in addition to that, uh, volunteers who uh, signed to re uh, respond from home in the event they were called. Uh, I don't have anything else to, re oh yes, I have one other thing to report. Uh, we've had 10 of our volunteers hired uh, by various uh, districts in the area. Uh, one of them was Kirk Hamley, uh, our uh, former president. And uh, I have been uh, placed in the role of interim president until we have elections in June. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Did you say 10 volunteers were fired by hired. our district? Oh, hired. H-I-R-E-D. Oh, oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They, they were hired by surrounding districts as far as Cornelius, as an example. Yeah, correct. Good. Thank you, Jerry. Any, any questions or sh sh comments to share? Okay, um, included in our packages is correspondence and informational items. The board of next meeting will be on February 28, 5 p.m. by remote video conferencing. Now, we are going to adjourn or recess the regular board meeting. Since this is a short board meeting, what does my fellow board members think? We don't need a break, we can just switch back and. Continue, is that okay? Okay. The regular board meeting is now recessed at 5.54. Board members, please log out of this Zoom meeting and log into executive session Zoom meeting. Hi, Michael. You look like a superhero, a Spider-Man or something. <laughs> he's looking down. Yeah, I don't know if he's, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's trying to unmute the phone is my guess. And, but the good thing is I see him smiling. So I know he's not, he's breathing. That's a good that, thing. Yeah. <laughs> I've been there. I feel for you, Michael. <laughs>
All right, there's Jay. Jay's here. Chris I is not there. there. I was there that you just didn't see me to let me back in, but I was <laughs> watching you guys the whole time. <laughs> That's what happens when you're retired. Yeah, I know that you get ignored a lot. You get invisible, yeah. <laughs> Tracy, is Chris waiting or? There's Chris. Oh, here he is. Okay. Jay, are you trying to beat me on the gray beard thing going? It's like I told Marilyn when she said something about it. I was afraid of growing it because I thought I looked like a Q-tip. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I don't, have, I don't have gray hair, but boy, my beard comes in that way. But, but you know, last I, time, last meeting, I think it was Leslie was coming and rubbing that she likes the blood test meeting. You will now convene at 6.58 p.m. In executive session, no decisions or actions were made and regarding a personal matter. Um, Chief, did you have anything else to update or report? Isn't no. that something we are going to discuss? No, I don't think there was uh, a need for anything. Uh, nope, we were good. Okay. All right, then. Since there is no other item to discuss, the regular board of directors meeting is now adjourned at 6.59 p.m. Thank you, friends. Well, have a wonderful night. evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. You guys too. Thanks, Chris, for uh, for jumping on.